Want to be happy? Live a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know you're capable of more. You have Michael Jordan level talent at something. So today, let's live your best belief life and get some of the best Jordan Peterson motivation. Enjoy. Stop doing the things that you know are wrong that you could stop doing, right? So it's, it's, a, fairly, it's a fairly limited attempt. First of all, we're not going to say that you know what the good is or what the truth is in any ultimate sense. But we will presume that there are things that you're doing that for one reason or another you know are not in your best interests. There's something about them that you just know you should stop. They're kind of self-evident to you. Other things you're going to be doubtful about, you're not going to know which way is up and which way is down. But there are things that you're doing that you know you shouldn't do. Now, some of those you won't stop doing for whatever reason. You don't have the discipline or maybe there's a secondary payoff or you don't believe it's necessary or it's too much of a sacrifice or you're angry or resentful or, or afraid. Who knows? So forget about those for now. But there's another subset that you could stop doing. It might be a little thing. Well, that's fine. Stop doing it and see what happens. And what'll happen is, your vision will clear a little bit. And then something else will pop up in your field of apprehension that you will also know you should stop doing and that you could stop doing because you strengthened yourself a bit by stopping doing the particular stupid thing that you were doing before. That just puts you together a little bit more. And you could do that repeatedly for, for an indefinite period of time. And, and you know that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to ever be able to formulate a clear and final picture of what constitutes the truth and the good but it does mean that you'll be able to continually move away from what's untruth and what's bad and you know that's not a bad start make a schedule and stick to it okay so what's the rule with the schedule it's not a bloody prison that's the first thing that people do wrong they say well i don't like to have, follow a schedule it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And obviously, there's a bit of responsibility that's going to go along with that. Because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're going to insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than you were that, than at the beginning of the day, right? Because that's a stupid day. If you have a bunch of those in a row, you just dig, you know, you dig yourself a hole and then you bury yourself in it. It's like, sorry, that's just not a good strategy. It's a bad strategy. So maybe... 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the damn things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that, just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you got to work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you going to do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that, you know. So maybe you do an hour of, of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. You know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero, right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week, or 50.5% for God's sake, or because you're, you're going to hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. I know you stated in the last... Um, uh, lecture that the importance for setting aims in life yeah. and um, uh, to kind of have goal, goals to uh, work towards, right? So my question was, um, where, do, where do you, how do you do that if you don't know where you want to go? Because that's kind of where I got stuck on your, your future authoring program yeah. because... Yeah. Okay, uh, that's, that's a good question. That's a really good question. So there's this notion in the Old Testament that morality is 
following a sequence of prohibitions. There's a bunch of bad things you shouldn't do, and then basically you're good enough. And, and, and I think there's wisdom in that. I, I think that's kind of where children start, right? You, you, I mean, I love children and all that, but they're, they're, they're crazy little creatures, and they need to be, you know, civilized. And well, partly what you do is you, you lay prohibitions on them, and mostly what you're trying to do is lay prohibitions on them for the behaviors that, if they manifested, would make their life miserable. So this is why this thing that I've said to people has become this crazy internet meme, but that's to clean up your room, and, <laughs> which, which is a lot better and more useful than people think. It's a lot harder, too. But the, the, thing, the first thing you do, I think, and I learned this in part from Solzhenitsyn when he was trying to iron out his soul when he was in the gulag because he was trying to figure out how he got there, how he contributed to how he got there. You know, not Stalin and Hitler, even though they were kind of to blame, you know, but there wasn't much he could do about that. I think what you have to do, and, and this is part of humility, is you have to look around you within your sphere of influence, like the direct sphere of influence, and fix the things that announce themselves as in need of repair. And those are often small things, you know, and, and they can be like your room. Put it in order, because the thing is, it isn't exactly so important that your room is in order, although it is. What's important is that you learn how to distinguish between chaos and order, and to be able to act in a manner that produces order. When people are beset with a catastrophe, like let's say the death of their father, that they are prone to use that as an excuse for not going about the business that they should be going about. Because they can say to themselves, well, I would accept. And accept, there's always good reasons. I mean, believe me, there's always good reasons for not doing what you should. That's for sure. The reasons pile up day after day to not do what you should, especially because you're, you're aiming at things in the future. You can put them off indefinitely, right? Because of the demands of the day. There's no excuse whatsoever for not getting at what it is that you should be doing. It's absolutely reprehensible to justify your inaction with a catastrophe that extracts mercy from other people, right? There's a tricky, tricky game that's going, well, of course I can't do that. Look at the terrible thing that's just happened to me. It's, yeah, okay, I understand. You're absolved of any necessity to move forward because of your current catastrophe. It's like, well, actually you're not. And it's rather rude of you to use it as an excuse. And it's certainly counterproductive. Sometimes, you know, I'll, I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about something and usually what I'll do is go write it down. I have some writing to do, so I get up and I go write down what I'm thinking and that usually does the trick. But because I had been playing with YouTube, I thought, well, I'll try making YouTube video and, and telling people what I'm thinking about and, and see if that performs the same uh, function as writing. And to me, the function of writing, well, it's twofold. One is conceivably to communicate with people, although the fundamental purpose for me is to clarify my thoughts so that I know, to, you know, because if, you're, if something is disturbing you, what that means is that it needs to be articulated. It, what, it's the emergence of unexplored territory, something that disturbs you. That, that's the right way to think about it. It's unmapped territory that's manifesting itself. It's like a vista of threat and possibility. And you need to articulate a path through it. And so that's what I was doing. It's like, I was thinking, well, this is bothering me and this seems to be why and here's what I think is going on. And, and so I made the videos and in some sense, I, I didn't think anything more of it. You don't have to necessarily have done anything wrong for things to get completely out of control. It's a terrifying doctrine. But it's not a hopeless doctrine because it still says that there's a way forward, there's a pathway forward. And the pathway forward is to adopt a mode of being that has some nobility so that you can tolerate yourself and perhaps even have some respect for yourself as someone who's capable of standing up in the face of that terrible vulnerability and suffering. And that the pathway forward, as far as the existentialists are concerned, is by, well, certainly by the avoidance of deceit, particularly in language but also by the adoption of responsibility for the conditions of existence and some attempt on your part to actually rectify them. And the thing that's so interesting about that is, well, two, as far as I'm concerned, and some of this is from clinical experience, you know, if you take people 
and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades-long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that Perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. My experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages, if you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not gonna last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient? 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. It isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way, and then it'll decline rapidly. But 7 billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that 7 billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you know, you'll know a thousand people, at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each, and that puts you one person away from a million, and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected, and the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward, and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend, and it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. It's better for it to matter. 
But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. Now when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff, and I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr, so that's a pretty good deal, all things considered. Especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's really, really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's, a light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends. Because that's what happened in the 20th century. Psychologists have been, not all psychologists obviously, but the psychological profession is, is neck deep in this, in this pathology, has been beating the self-esteem drum for 50 years. Oh no, you're okay, you should feel good about yourself. Like, you're, you're fine the way you are. It's like you think, well that's a calming message for people. It's like, no it's not. It's not at all, and I, I watch my audiences, it's like, it's full of people in the audience who think, I'm suffering a lot more than I think is tenable, a whole bunch of it's my fault, my life is not in the order it should be, I know I'm doing 50 things wrong. It's like, what the hell's wrong with me? What's wrong with the people around me? This is really serious. And some, you know, well-meaning person comes up and says, you know, you're okay just the way you are. It's like, no one wants that message. It's like, no, I'm not okay the way I am. I'm not okay at all the way I am. I know that. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm speaking, to, to, when I'm speaking now, I say to people, well, well you're nowhere near what you could be. That's the, that's the positive message. It's like, yeah, you're a mess, but you don't have to stay that way. If you're a mess, you know it, obviously. You're suffering away like, like so much you can barely tolerate it. It's like, that's okay. You can do something about it. If you're hungry and you eat, well, that's good. But it's over, and then you're on to the next thing, right? It, it's not exactly sustaining, it's just necessary. That's called consumatory reward, by the way. This other reward system is incentive reward. And the incentive reward system works on dopamine, this neurochemical dopamine, which is also the, the neurochemical tracks that opiates and cocaine and amphetamines, the drugs that people really like to abuse, alcohol often for some people, um, activate. And so you might say if you don't have enough meaning in your life, then you're more prone to addiction. And that's definitely the case, even with rats. If you take a rat and you put him in a cage by himself and he has nothing to do, and then you give him access to cocaine, he'll get addicted to the point where he won't do anything but take cocaine. But if you throw the rat back in with a bunch of other rats and he gets to do rat things, then it's very hard to get him addicted to cocaine. And so the purposeless rat is prone to addiction. Well, it's the same with human beings. Now, here's a corollary to that, which is really cool. So the magnitude of the reward you experience as you're moving towards a goal is proportionate to the importance of the goal. So that means the more important the goal you pick, the more possibility there is for the kind of reward, let's say, it's really a state of being that is life affirming and it is directly life affirming in that, you know, like if you're in a football game and, you're, and it's an important football game and maybe you break a finger and, you know, normally that's, that's a problem, it hurts, and you're gonna stop doing whatever you're doing, but if you're right in the middle of the game, then you'll be so amped up on this reward system that it's analgesic, it stops the pain, it also suppresses anxiety. So, if you have a purpose, then it's analgesic, it, it takes some of the pain out of life, it's very positive in that it motivates and energizes you and focuses you and makes you able to remember and, and pay attention, and it, it quells fear. And so those things are all direct. And so then you might think, well, what's the best possible goal? Well, and that's, that's the purpose, I would say, of religious training and philosophical training. It's like, just what are you doing in the world? Rule eight, tell the truth, or at least don't lie. 
yeah, well, it's not that easy to tell the truth because who knows about the truth, but you can learn not to say things that you know to be false. And if you stop saying things that you know to be false, then your life will improve a lot. It simplifies it and it puts you in alignment with reality. And you should be in alignment with reality because there's a lot more of it than there is of you. Many times in life, people don't get what they want and they need because they don't aim at it. And it's a hard lesson for people to learn because they're cynical to begin with and they presume that there's no possible way of moving forward. But it's not so unreasonable to assume that you're not going to hit what you don't aim at or you're not going to hit what you aim at and don't shoot at. And I've seen time and time again that if people do put forward a vision for what they regard as worthy of pursuit, which is something you have to determine in dialogue with yourself, it's like given the difficult preconditions of existence, is there anything that you could conceive of that you would regard as sufficiently worthwhile so that you would be motivated to pursue it? it it's, a, it's, a, it's a profound philosophical question, and it's not an unreasonable one. It's, it's a good place to start. It's like, well, life is difficult and enough to make you cynical and bitter, and perhaps enough to make you cynical and bitter and suicidal and homicidal and even genocidal. And it's not surprising in some sense. And then the question is, well, is there something that you can pursue that allows that to be acceptable or perhaps even desirable, which is something to do that justifies the suffering? And it's hard to say what that would be for each of you. It's something that you can discover. This is partly why Nietzsche was wrong. Nietzsche thought that after God had died, that human beings would have to invent their own values. But the psychoanalysts, I would say Jung foremost among them, put forward a very powerful counterclaim, which was that, well, you can't invent values. They're already built into you. You have to discover them. And I think that's true for each person. It's like, well, what would justify you in, in the abandonment of your resentment and hostility? The next best predictor of lifetime success is conscientiousness. Well, so, and of the, of the two aspects of conscientiousness, say orderliness and, and industriousness, the better predictor is industriousness. So the question is, well, what can you do about your industriousness? And the answer to that is, well, that's kind of rough too, because there's a strong genetic component. But you can work on micro habits with regards to your conscientiousness. And I think the best micro habits, this is partly to do with this, future authoring program processes, I think the best thing you can do with regards to your conscientiousness is to set up some aims for yourself, goals that you actually value. And the future authoring program helps people do that. And basically it does a, a situational analysis of, it helps you do a situational analysis of your life more than a psychological analysis, I would say. And so, so the questions are something like, well, all right, you're gonna have to put some effort into your life and you need to be motivated to do that. And so what are the potential sources of motivation? Well, you could think about them in, in the big five manner. You know, if you're extroverted, you want friends. If you're agreeable, you want an intimate relationship. If you're disagreeable, you want to win competitions. If you're open, you want to engage in creative activity. If you're high in eroticism, you want security. Okay, so those are all sources of potential motivation that you could draw on, that you could tailor to your own, you know, your own personality. But then there are dimensions that you want to consider your life across. And so we ask people about, well, you know, if you could have your life the way you wanted it in three to five years, if you were taking care of yourself properly, you know, what would you want from your friendships? What would you want from your intimate relationship? How would you like to structure your family? What do you want for your career? Well, how are you going to use your time outside of your job? And how are you gonna regulate your mental, physical, mental and physical health and maybe also your drug and alcohol use? Because that's, that's a good place to auger down, you know, because alcoholism, for example, wipes out, you know, five to 10% of people. So you wanna keep that under control and then and then so maybe you know you 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 develop a vision of what your life what you would like your life to be and that associates the so the goal well, once the goal is established and then you break down the goal into micro processes that you can implement the micro processes become rewarding in proportion in relation to their uh, causal association with the goal and that tangles in your 
your incentive reward system. You know, we talked about the dopaminergic incentive reward system, and that's the thing that keeps you moving forward. And the way it works is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal. Okay, well, what's the implication of that? Better have a valued goal, because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal, in principle, the more the microprocesses associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. And so what that means is, well, you get up in the morning and you're excited to, about the day, you're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal, maybe you also specify a place you wanna stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding, because that's also useful. You specify your goal, you, you, do, that, you do that in so, some sense as a unique individual, you want to you specify goals that make you say, oh, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. Because the question always is, why do something? Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and you don't do anything. That's real easy. The question is, why would you ever do anything? And the answer to that has to be because you've determined by some means that it's worthwhile. And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. And the other would be, well, you kind of look at how, look at what it is that people accrue that's valuable across the lifespan. Look, look what, so you do a structural analysis of the subcomponents of human existence and I already did that. You need a family, you need friends. Like you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, plans for you know, time outside of work, uh, attention to your mental and physical health, et cetera. You know, those are, that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, well, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's, that's, a, bad, that's a bad deal for you. So, so once you, but once you set up that, that goal structure, let's say, and that's really, in many, in many ways, that's what you should be doing at university. Is, is, that's exactly what you should be doing, is trying to figure out who it is that you're trying to be, right? And you, you, you aim at that. And then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you wanna be. And, and I really mean want to be, I don't mean should be, even those things, those things are gonna overlap. And it's important to distinguish between those because that's partly, and this is back down to the micro routine analysis. So if I was saying, well, you're gonna to try to make yourself more industrious. Okay, number one, specify your goals because how are you gonna hit something if you don't know what it is? That isn't gonna happen. And often people won't specify their goals too because they don't like to specify conditions for failure. So if you keep yourself all vague and foggy, which is real easy because that's just a matter of not doing as well, then you don't know when you fail. And people might say, well, I really don't wanna know when I fail because that's painful. So I'll, I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. So, so I would recommend that you don't let that happen. So that's willful blindness, right? You could have known, but you chose not to. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, it looks like that might be worth living, despite the fact that it's gonna be, you know, anxiety provoking and threatening, and there's gonna be some suffering and loss involved in all of that, obviously. The goal is to, to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. I started to pay very careful attention to what I was saying. I don't know if that happened voluntarily or involuntarily, but I could feel a sort of split developing in my psyche. And, the split, and I've actually had students tell me the same thing that has happened to them after they've listened to some of the material that, that I've been describing to all of you. But I split into two, let's say. And one part was the, let's say the old me that was talking a lot and that liked to argue and that liked ideas. And there was another part that was watching that part, like just with its eyes open and neutrally judging. And the part that was neutrally judging was watching the part that was talking and going, that isn't your idea. You don't really believe that. You don't really know what you're talking about. That isn't true. And I thought, hmm, that's really interesting. So now I've, and that was happening to like 95% of what I was saying. And so then I didn't really know what to do. I thought, okay, this is strange. So maybe I've, I've fragmented and that's just not a good thing at all. I mean. It wasn't like I was hearing voices or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't like that. It was, it was 
well, people have multiple parts. So then I had a, this weird conundrum. It was like, well, which of these two things are me? Is it the part that's listening and saying, no, that's rubbish, that's a lie, that's, you're doing that to impress people, you're just trying to win the argument, you know? Was that me or was the part that was going about my normal verbal business me? And I didn't know, but I decided I would go with the critic. And then what I d tried to do, what I learned to do, I think, was to stop saying things that made me weak. And now that, that, I mean, I'm still trying to do that because I'm always feeling when I talk whether or not the words that I'm saying are either making me align or making me come apart. And I think the alignment, I really do think the alignment is, is, I think alignment is the right way of conceptualizing it because I think if you say things that are as true as you can say them, let's say, then they come up, they come out of the depths inside of you. Because we don't know where thoughts come from. We don't know how far down into your substructure the thoughts emerge. We don't know what processes of physiological alignment are necessary for you to speak from the core of your being. We don't understand any of that. We don't even conceptualize that, but I believe that you can feel that. And I learned some of that from reading Carl Rogers, by the way, who's a great clinician, uh, because he talked about mental health in part as a coherence between the the, the, the spiritual or the, or the abstract and the physical, that the two things were aligned. And, and there's a lot of idea of alignment in, in psychoanalytic and clinical thinking. But anyways, I decided that I would start practicing not saying things that would make me weak. And what happened was that I had to stop saying almost everything that I was saying. I would say 95% of it. As a of a shock to wake up and, and I mean, this was over a few months, but it's, of a shock to wake up and realize that you're mostly dead wood. It's a shock, you know, and you might think, well, do you really want all of that to burn off? It's like, well, there's nothing left but a little husk, 5% of you. It's like, well, if that 5% is solid, then maybe that's exactly what you want to have happen. Adopt the mode of authentic being. And that is something like refusing to participate in the lie, in deception and the lie, to orient your speech as much as you can towards the truth and to take responsibility for your own life and perhaps also for the lives of other people. And there's something about that that's meaningful and responsible and noble, but also serves to mitigate the very suffering that produces, say, the nihilism or the flee into the arms of, flee or, 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 the, or the escape into the arms of totalitarians to begin with. You need something to shelter you against your own vulnerability. If you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to, to survive and to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. That's a hypothesis, and it's not some simple hypothesis, right? Because it, what it basically says is, if you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. Well, how are you going to find out if that's true? Well, it, it's a Kierkegaardian leap of faith. There's no way you're going to find out whether or not that's true unless you do it. So, no, no one can tell you either, because just because it works for someone else, I mean, that's interesting and all that, but it's no proof that it'll work for you. You have to be all in in this game. There is no more effective way of operating in the world than to conceptualize the highest good that you can and then strive to attain it. There's no more practical pathway to the kind of success that you could have if you actually knew what success was. The world shifts itself around your aim, because you're, you're a creature that has an aim. You have to have an aim in order to do something. You're an aiming creature. You look at a point and you move towards it. It's built right into you. And so you have an aim. Well, let's say your aim is the highest possible aim. Well then, so that sets up the world around you. It, it organizes all of your perceptions. It organizes what you see and you don't see. It organizes your emotions and your motivations. So you organize yourself around that aim. And then what happens is the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems, and if you solve them properly, then you stay on the pathway towards that aim. And you can concentrate on the, on the, on the day. And so that way you get to have your cake and eat it too, because you can, you can point into the distance, the far distance, 
and you can live in the day. And it seems to me that that's, that makes every moment of the day supercharged with meaning. That, that's how, because if everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. This circumambulation that Jung talked about was this continual, we'll return to this, this continual circling in some sense of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life. You know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And there might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, you remember that for a sec, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea, because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea, and which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help. Because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being, it, you know, it's, it's, you have to take it into account fundamentally, and work with it. And so, and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny, and you can assume that you're going to do it badly. And that's really useful, because you don't have to beat yourself up. It's pretty easy to do it badly. But the thing is, it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all. So you, you start your path, and you think that you're heading you know, towards your star. And so you go in that direction. And then, because... You're here, the world looks a particular way, but then when you move here, the world looks different, and you're different as a consequence of having made that voyage. And so what that means is that now that thing that glimmers in front of you is going to have shifted its location because you weren't very good at specifying it to begin with, and now that you're a little sharper and more focused than you were, it's, it's going to reveal itself with more accuracy to you. And so then you have to take a... You know, it's almost like a 180 degree reversal, but it isn't because, you know, you've, I mean, you've gone this far and that's a long ways to get that far, but that's a lot farther than you would be if you just stayed where you were waiting. And so it doesn't matter that you overshoot continually because as you overshoot, even if you don't learn what you should have done, you're going to continually learn what you shouldn't keep doing. And if you learn enough about what you shouldn't keep doing, then that's tantamount at some point to learning at the same time what you should be doing. So it's okay. So it's like this. Now, what's cool about it though, I think, is that as you progress, the degree of overshooting starts to decline, right? And that we know that there's nothing hypothetical about that. As you learn a new skill, like even to play, play a song on the piano, for example, you overshoot madly. You're making all sorts of mistakes to begin with, and then the mistakes, they, they disappear. I'm incredibly cool. nervous to uh, talk in front of you because you've got to be one of the most formidable people that I've ever heard of or ever listened to or ever seen. So my question is, again, you're one of the best communicators that I've ever listened to. If I could be half as good at you, or at communicating as you are, I would be set. How can I teach myself to do that? Practice. You know, really, like, well, there's a couple of things. Is it helps to read a lot. It really helps to write. So if you want to make yourself 
articulate, which is a very good idea, then not only should you read, but you should write down what you think. And if you can do that a little bit every day, 15 minutes, maybe you could steal 15 minutes and do it every day. But if you do that for 10 years, you really straighten out your thinking. If you're gonna speak effectively, you have to know way more than you're talking about, you know, so if you, this is often difficult for beginning lectures at university because they'll do a lecture on a topic, but they only know as much as they're saying in the lecture. And they get kind of stuck to their notes because of it. But you want to know 10 times as much as you are saying in the lecture, and then you can specify a stepping path through it and elaborate with the other things that you know. But to do that, you have to do a lot of reading. But you also have to do a lot of reading because that's where the synthesize, that's where the synthesizing comes. So that's on the input side. And then on the output side, well, there's some tricks, techniques, let's say, is like if you're speaking in front of a group, you are not delivering a talk to a group. That's not what you're doing. The talk isn't a packaged thing that you present to a group. There isn't a group. There's a bunch of individuals. And you talk to them. So when I talk to a group, I always talk to people one at a time. And that makes it easier, too, because you know how to talk to a person. It's like, can you talk to a thousand people? Well, probably not, because it's too intimidating. But there isn't a thousand people there. There's a thousand individuals. And so you just look at an individual, and you say something. And you can tell if they're engaged. They look confused, or they look interested, or they look angry, or they look bored, or maybe they're asleep, in which case you look at someone else. <laughs> And they, they give you feedback about how you're doing. And so one thing is to, to have something to say, yeah. But the next thing is pay attention to who you're talking to. Because unless you're very badly socialized, and that seems unlikely in your case, because you, know, you present yourself at least moderately well, you know. And well, I mean, I don't know you very well, but on first, but on first sight, you know, you're, you're doing fine. So the probability that if you pay attention to the individuals that you're talking to, that your natural wealth of, of social skill will manifest itself is extremely high. And so you don't deliver a talk to an audience. That's a really bad way of thinking about it. You're actually engaged in a conversation with an audience. Even if they're not talking, they're nodding and shifting position and you know looking like this or and you can you can pull all that in and and, and use it to govern the level at which you're addressing the entire audience. So the last thing I would say is, well, having the aim to be a good communicator is a good start. And you think, well, I could buttress that to some degree. Well, there isn't anything that you can possibly, this is the whole point of a liberal education. There isn't anything that you can possibly do that makes you more competent in everything you do than to learn how to communicate. I don't care if you're gonna be a carpenter. I mean, being a carpenter, by the way, is very difficult, especially if you're a good carpenter, but if you're good at communicating as a carpenter, you're like 10 times better as a carpenter. So, the, and this is something that the liberal arts colleges, I think, have, I don't know if they've forgotten it, but they don't do a very good job of marketing. It's like, well, what's the use of a bachelor's degree, a bachelor of arts? It's like, well, you can think, you can write, you can speak, you've read something. It's like, the economic value of that is incalculable. The people that I've watched in my life who've been spectacularly successful are, they have skills, clearly. That, that's a minimum precondition. But they're also very, very good at articulating themselves. And so whenever they negotiate, they're successful. Well, that's kind of like the definition of success in life, right? You negotiate and you're successful. It doesn't mean you win, because if you're a good negotiator, if you're a really good negotiator, everybody walks away from the negotiation thrilled. And so then people line up to do things with you. So, and that's all, in, that's all dependent on your ability to communicate. So, practice. The best thing you can do is teach people to write. Because there's no difference between that and thinking. And one of the things that just blows me away about universities is that no one ever tells students why they should write something. It's like, well, you have to do this assignment. Well, why are you writing? Well, you need the grade. It's like, no, you need to learn to think. 
because thinking makes you act effectively in the world. Thinking makes you win the battles you undertake, and those could be battles for good things. If you can think and speak and write, you are absolutely deadly. Nothing can get in your way. So that's why you learn to write. It's like, and I can't believe that people aren't just told that. It's, it's, it's like, it's the most powerful weapon you can possibly provide someone with. And I, I mean, I know lots of people who've been staggeringly successful and watched them throughout my life. I mean, those people, you don't want to have an argument with them. They'll just slash you into pieces. And not in a malevolent way. It's like, if you're going to make your point and they're going to make their point, you better have your points organized because otherwise you are going to look like and be an absolute idiot. You are not going to get anywhere. And if you can formulate your arguments coherently and make a presentation, if you can speak to people, if you can lay out a proposal, God, people give you money, they give you opportunities, you have influence. If you're harmless, you're not virtuous. You're just harmless. You're like a rabbit. A rabbit isn't virtuous. It's just, it just can't do anything except get eaten. It's not virtuous. If you're a monster and you don't act monstrously, then you're virtuous. But you also have to be a monster. Well, you see this all the time. Harry Potter's like that too. It's like he's, he's flawed, he's hurt, he's got evil in him. He can talk to snakes, man. He breaks rules all the time. All the time. He's not at obedient at all. But, you know, he has a good reason for breaking the rules. And, it, and if he couldn't break the rules, him and his little clique of rule-breaking, you know, troublemakers, if they didn't break the rules, they wouldn't attain the highest goal. So it's very peculiar, but it's, it's very, very, it's a very, 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 very common mythological notion. You know, the hero has to be... The hero has to be a monster. But a controlled monster. Batman is like that, you know? I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's the story you always hear. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. Yeah, because if you're comparing yourself to someone else, I mean, first of all, you don't know very much about the life of the person you're comparing yourself to. You don't know it, it, you know it across all of its dimensions. And second, people are very different. And so comparing yourself to someone else, it's, it's kind of useful, I guess, when you're young. But as you get older and more singular and more particular, it becomes increasingly less useful. Better to compare yourself to a previous version of yourself and work for improvement in that way. When I was 25 or so, I probably weighed about 138 pounds. I smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day. I drank a tremendous amount of alcohol. I was from Northern Alberta, this rough little town up in Northern Alberta called Fairview. And you know, there were long winters there and my friends were heavy drinkers and most of them dropped out of school by the time they were 15 or 16, went off to work on the oil rigs. And you know, it was a rough town and we drank a lot. And I started when I was 14 and you know, um, and so, I was, I had a lot of bad habits, let's say, and uh, things that were, and I wasn't in great shape physically, and I was also still intellectually obsessed by, as I am now, and uh, so that would have been, that would have been in 85, but when I, but I decided around then, about 85, 84, something like that, maybe a little earlier, that I was really going to try to get my act together, and uh, so I started doing that, I, you know, I, first of all, I, I quit smoking. Well, that took a long time because I eventually had to quit drinking too in order to quit smoking. And I started working out and playing sports, which I'd never done. You know, I don't regret that. I had a fine time when I was a kid, and but uh, I needed really to get disciplined. And I had to do it because I was working on these hard problems that, you know, that I've been discussing with all of you. And I've been working on them really, you know, obsessively since I was probably about 18, maybe even earlier than that. And got to the point around 25 when I was in graduate school trying to get my PhD, so doing all my research. Like I published 15 papers by the time I graduated with my PhD, which was by, I think, by a fairly large measure, the most papers that any graduate student at that time had ever published at McGill. I think that's right. Might have been twice as many or maybe twice as many, maybe even three times as many. And at the same time, I wrote Maps of Meaning, which was a terrible, terrible, terribly difficult thing to do because I was writing about three hours a day doing that and I couldn't do all that and continue with my misbehavior you know my sort of my what what would you say my 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 hedonistic my hedonistic 
ma my massive hedonistic consumption of alcohol and all of that, I just couldn't keep it up and also work seriously on the issues that were at hand. So, you know, I had to stop. That's a sacrifice. I had to stop messing about and straighten myself out. You're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility because, you know, people play a role in their own demise, so to speak. When you had opportunity to go out and explore or withdraw because you were afraid, you chose to withdraw because you were afraid. So it's not only that you were overprotected often, it's that you were willing to take advantage of the pr fact that you were overprotected and run back there whenever you had the opportunity. You know, so maybe you're a kid in the playground, right, and you're having some trouble with other kids, and you know in the back of your mind, I should deal, this with, deal with this myself, but you go and tell your mom and get her to intervene. And you know that that's not right. You know that you're breaking the social contract, but it's easier, and so that's what you do. You run off to an authority figure and hide behind the great father, right, roughly speaking. Well, the problem with that is you don't learn how to do it yourself. So then you have to relearn it painfully when you're 40. So then you take people out, you say, well, what are you afraid of? Rank it from one to 10. So 10 is, we'll make a list of 10 things you're afraid of. The least, the thing you're least afraid of, we'll call number 10. So we'll start with that. Okay, well, I'm afraid of elevators. Okay, well, let's, let's look at a picture of an elevator. Let's have you imagine being in an elevator. Let's go out to an elevator and let you watch the terrible jaws of death open because that's how you're responding to it symbolically, right? And you're gonna do that at it at the, the closest proximity you can manage. You find out you go do that, it works. You're nervous as hell, especially an, from an anticipatory perspective. Shaking. You go out, you stop, you watch it happen, and you actually calm down. You do that 10 times and it no longer bothers you. Well, what you've learned that you didn't die, but more importantly than that, you've learned that you could withstand the threat of death. That's what you've learned. And then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and finally you're back in what's no longer the elevator from a symbolic perspective. It's a tomb, right? It's, it's, it's a place of enclosure and isolation. And you learn, hmm, turns out I can withstand that. And then you're met much more together, much more confident. And that's often one of the things that often happens in situations like that. I've seen this multiple times is that if you run someone through an exposure training process like that and, and toughen them up, they'll often start standing up to people around them in a way they never did before. Well, the first thing I think you need to understand is that these people that you're comparing yourself to, you don't really know very well. You know, and um, what that means is that you see their shiny outside, but you don't see the reality of their life. And so what you're... You know, maybe you're in California, see someone speeding down the road in a, in a convertible Porsche and you think, oh man, what a lucky bastard. And um, the truth of the matter is that he's thinking about wrapping his expensive sports car around the next cement pillar that he comes close to. You know, you, you can't tell and people have hard lives and, and even people who are comparatively fortunate have hard lives. And so the, the ideal that you're observing that makes you jealous and resentful is in large part an illusion that's created by your own mind. And I... You know, I, I can give you just one example. Like I know a fair number of extremely wealthy people and um, most of them, most of the people I happen to know are people who've made them, their money themselves. And I tell you, man, they have a burden of responsibility that would, would crush me, would, would crush the typical person. They're, they're just working flat out, like 90 hours a week, and they have thousands of people depending on them. And, you know, they have their money, and, and they have their status, and that's not nothing. But don't be thinking that there isn't a price to be paid for that. You know, they don't see their families, they're often divorced, they don't see their children grow up, and, and they don't have time off. Now, there are wealthy, what would you call, playboy types, I suppose, who live out the dreams of wealth of a foolish 14-year-old, but they're not that common, and 
you have to be careful of what you're jealous of because you don't really know what it is. And, and then the other thing that's kind of useful is to, well, to understand that you're different from everyone else. And it, it, this is especially true as you get older. When, when you're 17 or 16 or something like that, comparing yourself to other people makes a certain amount of sense because 16 and 17 year olds, they're kind of the same, you know, which is why when you go off to university, you can make friends so quickly. It's like, I'm, I'm just about 60. It takes me like 15 years to make a friend now, you know, um, as opposed to the two months that it took when I was 17. Um, you're, you're quite different from other people and you shouldn't be comparing yourself to them because they're not like you, you know? They, they don't have your family. They don't have your temperament. They don't have your troubles. They don't have your abilities. The only person that... The only, the only person that has those is you. And this is why one of the rules, I think it's rule four, is compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. And see, that's a game you can win because you could be a little better today than you were yesterday. And that's a good thing. You're a little better, that, that's a good thing. And, and you know, no doubt there are some things that you could improve. You know, if you, if you sit and meditate for any length of time about what you're not doing optimally. But you have to be humble and wise enough to understand that you might have to aim pretty damn low, especially in those places where you're not functioning well. And it might be so embarrassing that you can't even, that you can't bring yourself to fathom that that's actually who you are. But, you know, Jung described the fool, the archetypal figure of the trickster and the fool as the precursor to the savior, to the redeemer. And that's unbelievable bit of wisdom because what Jung meant was that to put yourself together, which is to follow the path of redemption, to follow the redeemer, if the redeemer is a type of personality that you could in fact be inhabited by or manifest, then the first step towards that is to allow yourself to be a fool, right? It's because you, you don't know what you're doing. You have to admit that. And there's going to be a loss of ego or destruction of ego, arrogant ego that necessarily accompanies that. But you need the loss of that arrogant ego because it's precisely what's interfering with your movement forward. You know, it's part of the adversarial process mythologically speaking, that stops moral progress. You're too proud of who you think you are to notice what you're like so that you could change properly. You don't want to sacrifice that part of yourself. It's probably associated with some delusion that helps you maintain, you know, uh, what would you say, a positive, although very fragile self-image, you know, in the absence of genuine effort. If you concentrate solely on your career, you can get a long way in your career. And I would say that that's a strategy that a minority of men preferentially do. That, that's all they do. They work like 70, 80 hours a week. They go flat out on their career. They're staking everything on the small probability of exceptional status in a narrow domain. But it's, it's hard on them. They don't have a life. It's very difficult for them to have a family. They don't know how to take any leisure activity, like they get very one-dimensional. Now, it may be that that unidimensionality is the price you have to pay to be exceptional at one thing, right? Because if you're gonna be something like a genius level mathematician, and you wanna do that for, or a scientist say, it's like, you're in your lab, you're in your lab all the time, you're working 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week, you're smart, you're dedicated, you're unidimensional, and that's how you get to beat all the other people who are doing that. It's the only way. But the problem is you don't get a life. Now, if you love being a scientist and you have that kind of focus of mind, well, first of all, you're a rare person, and second, you're gonna pay for it. But fine, more power to you. But, but it's a, it's a risky business to do that. You sacrifice a lot for it. You know, and I would say most often, if you're speaking about having a healthy life, that isn't what you do. You spread yourself out more. So, you know, you have a family, you have some things that you do outside of work that are meaningful to you and useful. You, you have a network of friends. Um, well, that, that, those three things alone, or four things alone, are 
plenty to keep you well oriented. And then if one of those things collapses, you know, everything doesn't go. Now, the, the price you pay for that is the more you strive to optimize that balance, the less likely you are to be fantastically successful at any single one of them. But you might have a very, you know, if you con consider your life as a whole, that might be a winning strategy. It was, the night, it was the night before we were putting drywall in our house. We were redoing a house, and he had put in all the plastic piping, you know, and I was going to test the joints. They're supposed to be glued together with this pipe glue, right? And I said, oh, I told him I had to test the joints, and he said, well, you don't have to test my joints. They never leak. And I thought, yeah, that's okay. How about if I test them? So I went up on the third floor and filled the pipes with water, capping them in the basement like you're supposed to. And like half an hour later, I had two inches of water in the basement. There were 30 leaking joints. And that was the night before the drywallers were supposed to show up. So, well, so he wasn't particularly competent. That's the point of that story. But even more so, he had put a bunch of the plastic pipe outside where the drywall would be. So it would have been sticking through the wall. So I spent a frenetic night, you know, sawing through plastic pipe and re-gluing joints so that my well, so that the dry rollers could come in. What's the point? If you're gonna be a plumber, man, be a good plumber. Because otherwise all you do is go out there and cause trouble. We don't need people to cause more trouble. We need people to solve problems. You know, and so you can be a tradesman and you can be, you can make a lot of money as a tradesperson. It's a bloody, reliable, honorable, uh, forthright, productive way of making a living. And there is a hell of a lot of difference between a working man who knows what he's doing and one who doesn't both in terms of skill and ethics, right? And you work with someone who knows what they're doing, it's a bloody pleasure. They tell you what they're gonna do, they tell you how much it will cost, they go and do it, it works, and you pay them. Perfect, everyone's happy. And that's what happens when you have genuine hierarchies of competence. And so you, you listen to these panderers of egalitarianism, egalitarianism and equity, and they fail to recognize completely that there are differences in rank between people. It's not such a terrible thing, man. Maybe you wouldn't be a great lawyer. Like, it's certainly possible. Most people aren't. But that doesn't mean there isn't something you could be great at. There's lots of hierarchies to attempt to climb, and if you fail in one, go try in another. But the point is, you're still trying to aim for the top, and what the hell are you gonna do if you don't try to aim for the top? You know, flap about uselessly and whine about your life? It's not helpful. It'll just make you miserable. You're not reliable to anyone. You can't help out in a crisis. It's like, so you tell young people, and this is another message for conservatives, like, I don't care what you're gonna do, but go out there and make something of yourself for God's sake. Be an honest person and work and get to the top of whatever it is that you wanna get to the top of. You know, and, 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 and that stand up for yourself like a respectable human being and be a bit of a light on the world instead of a blight, you know? And you can tell young people that, and they haven't been told that by anyone now. And so the young men are so hungry for that that it's, it's painful to watch. They're so relieved when fi someone finally comes up and says, hey, you know, you, you get your act together a bit, discipline yourself, see if you can learn to tell the truth, concentrate on something for a year or two, you could be a bloody world beater. They think, really? That's possible? Wow, that would be, that would be interesting. That might make life, life worth living. It's like, yeah, it might. So why don't you go do it? That's what the damn universities were supposed to be teaching people. And they've forgotten that. I went to Harvard a month ago, a month and a half. I used to teach there. And I talked to a bunch of students, you know, and I told them, it's not easy to get into Harvard, you know? Like, you're a valedictorian if you're at Harvard. And not only are you a valedictorian, you're way better than most people at at least two other things, or you don't get in. And so, like, it's, I don't know what the acceptance rate is, like 5%, and believe me, not everybody applies, so it's a very selective school. And so why am I saying that? It's like, these are high-quality kids. So I told them what I just told you. It's like, here you are at Harvard. It's like, get yourself educated, man. Read some books, learn to talk, learn to think. Make yourself into something. Get the hell out there and make the world that put you here happy that you were put there in that great institution. You know, and they came up to me afterwards and said, God, I wish someone would have told us that when we were in our first year. It's like, Jesus, why didn't someone tell them that? For God's sake, it's supposed to be the greatest university in the world. Is it so difficult to figure that out? You don't tell your kid, here's an impossible thing. Why don't you go out and fail? You say, here's something worth going after. Here's a step you could take that would push you beyond where you are. 
but that you also have a reasonably high probability of succeeding at, mm -hmm. right? They call that- Within the, a time frame. Within yeah, yeah. some time frame. That's the other thing. You have to parameterize it with regards to time frame. That's right. And that puts you in the zone of proximal development. And that's a, that's a concept that was generated by a guy named Vygotsky. He was a Russian developmental psychologist and a smart one. It's where the idea of the zone comes from, mm, to be in the zone. Yes. And when you're in the zone, you're expanding your skills at, in a manner that's intrinsically rewarding because you're succeeding. And so you want to set, if you're good to yourself, you think, okay, I need to set a goal, but I need to set a goal that someone as stupid and useless as me could probably attain if they put some effort into it. Right. And then, you got, then you've got it perfectly because it's not so high that it's grandiose or impossible that you fail necessarily and then justify your bitterness. It's like, well, I could do, well, because that, that happens to people. <laughs> happens man. all the time. Yeah, it's like. See this all the time. You know, it's like, it's, yes, exactly. Well, I set a goal and I didn't attain it, so I'm not gonna set any more goals. Right. It's like, no, you set a goal that was inappropriate. For the you, time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right, you didn't calibrate it properly. Yeah. And, and you're playing a trick on yourself because you wanted to fail so that you could justify not having to try. Well. And being a victim, mm -hmm. yeah. Which isn't in helpful, you're still gonna be a victim. <laughs> it's yeah. like, there's still a way out of that, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, because life is this, life is a challenge that in some sense can't be surmounted. It's sad to see that people are disenchanted and nihilistic and depressed and anxious and aimless and, and perverse and vengeful and, and all of those things, it's terrible. And then to see people question whether that's necessary and then to start to rise out of it, it's like, it's so fun, like last night, I was at after my talk. It's overwhelming. I don't usually think about these things, but I was I was after my talk last night, and so all these people line up, and you know they have their 15, 15 seconds with me, and they're kind of tentative. They're excited and attentive when they come up to talk to me, and then they have you know 15 seconds of time to tell me something. I'm really listening to them, and they're hesitant about whether or not to share the good news about their life, you know? And I think it's often because when people share good news about their life, people don't necessarily respond positively. You know, they don't get encouragement. And people need so little encouragement. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. And so they'll tell me something good, and I mm. think, oh, that's so good. You know, somebody mm. says, oh, I'm getting along way better with my father. I haven't seen him for 10 years, and now we get along. It's like, mm. God, mm. great. Yeah. And then the, the power of that, you can't overstate the power of that for individuals to get their life together. The individual's mm. an unbelievably powerful force, and every single person who gets their act together a little bit has the capacity to spread that around them. Mm. It's, it's a chain reaction, and so it's a lovely thing to see. One of the things that's really interesting about the Old Testament is that, and the Jews in the Old Testament is that they don't take the path of Cain. Every time they're walloped by God, which is like fairly frequently, they say, we must have done something wrong and we have to set ourselves right. And that's a, an unbelievably heroic attitude because that's the alternative to cursing fate. It's like you take the responsibility for failure onto yourself. And you think, well, if I was just, maybe if I just had my act together a little bit more, if I took advantage of every opportunity that was put in front of me, if I wasn't resentful and bitter, then I could have done something that would have tilted the situation in a different direction. And like, that's almost inevitably true. Dostoevsky, I think, said something like, every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's a, it's a crazy statement, right? It's a crazy statement. And he was a pretty extreme person in many, many ways. But there's a level at which that's metaphysically true, you know, because what happens is that it's, it's failure to act often that's the most catastrophic, you know? I mean, I've, uh, it's, it's, it's to not do the right thing when the, when the situation presents itself. And it's very specific. You know, you're constantly in situations where you could do the right thing if you were willing to take a risk that's actually of relatively moderate size. And you know that you could take the risk and you know that you should take the risk and you don't. And that happens to people all the time. And then what happens is the thing that they didn't oppose grows a little bit and they shrink a little bit. I notice that there's always a group of of my friends who always criticize what I'm saying and not even um, try to understand what I'm where I'm coming from. And um, 
I've, I've, I've always wondered how to deal with that. I mean, I, I want to listen to what they are saying, but um, they are not understanding what I'm. They're not trying to listen to what I'm saying. So, what would you do in that situation? Okay, I'm going to answer that very briefly. Okay, there's a, a line in the New Testament that's relevant to that. Do not cast pearls before swine. And what that means is that if people are not listening to you, stop talking to them. And that's really, that is the best piece of advice that I can give you. And what happens is, is that if you stop talking to people who aren't listening to you and start watching them instead, they will tell you what they're up to. But so if you have things to say, say them, but you find people that will listen, talk to them. The ones who aren't listening, pull back. Because you're, you're devaluing what you have to say by offering it to an audience that does nothing but reject it. And that's a good guideline to life in general. So, pull back. First of all, you have to treat yourself like you matter. Because if you don't, then you don't take care of yourself, and you become vengeful and, and, and cruel. And you, you, take, you take it out on people around you, and you're not a positive force. None of that's good. So you suffer more, and so does everyone around you. And there's a malevolence that enters into it. None of that's good. So that's what happens if you don't treat yourself like you matter. And then well, what happens if you don't treat other people like they matter? Well, you lie to them, you cheat them, you steal, you, you, you enter into impulsive relationships with them. They can't trust you. That doesn't go anywhere. They don't like you. You, you end up alone at best and maybe like in, in, incarcerated at worst. Like that doesn't work. And so you watch the people around you who thrive regardless of what they say they act out the proposition that everyone matters. And then you have a functional society. And I think, okay, well, if, if, if when you act out the proposition that everyone matters, you have a functional society, maybe that's evidence that that proposition is true. If you're failing repeatedly, um, then there's probably something wrong. It's possible that there's something wrong with the way that you're conceptualizing the world. Because you have a choice, right? If, if you keep making sacrifices and they don't work. There's a binary choice, and one is, well, there's something wrong with the structure of reality, and the other is there's something wrong with your approach. And so then you might say, well, let's take the first idea, there's something wrong with the structure of reality. It's like, you're really gonna say that, are you? You're really gonna come out and say, I know enough to judge the nature of being. And, and then the alternative is also quite frightening because then, you know, you. It's you that's making the mistakes, and you might be wrong at a really deep level, and that might mean that a lot of you has to burn off and be transformed. Maybe even things about yourself that you think are admirable and that you like because your position, you know, your, your self-conceptualization is so warped and wrong, and that's really daunting. But, you know, when people set themselves up as the judge of being, I mean, I've written about this a fair bit in my new book, which is called 12 Rules for Life, when people set themselves up as the judge of being, then they take on what can only be described as a kind of satanic arrogance because they've actually taken to themselves the moral right to criticize the structure of existence itself. It's like, you better be careful when you do something like that because you're setting yourself up as the judge of being. I like this one and I think, I mean, this is very clearly what you do. Be precise in your speech. <laughs> So in, in Genesis, one of the things God has Adam do first, so God makes the world by speaking. Okay, so that's the first thing to think about. You're supposed to think like in a sophisticated way about this. The idea is that there's some integral relationship between communication and the structure of being. It's part of the role that consciousness plays in the world, whatever that role is. Language takes the chaos and makes it into things. And so, God has Adam name all the animals. They're, they're not even really real until they have names. Now, they're more implicit, that's another. You know, here's an, here's an example. Let's say that you're having a rough patch in your relationship, and you don't know why. It's unnameable. Is it real? Well, yeah, it's manifesting itself in a, like a physiological discomfort. Then you talk about it and you name it. It's like, it goes from this blurry thing that's kind of potential, and it goes snap, mm -hmm. and then it's this thing, right? And then that's a horrible thing. It's like a little poisonous thing, but it's not a whole foggy cloud of potential poison. It's like this little sharp poison thing. And then you think, okay, it's real. It's a little monster, but it's not, it's little at least, 
And now probably we can do something about it if we can admit to it. So it's this precision that specifies. And like, so this is a little bit of the Voldemort effect, right? If, since you're a Harry Potter guy, they wouldn't name him. Right. This is right, the problem. Right. We gotta name him first. Oh yeah, you gotta name him first. Absolutely, because the unnameable is far more terrifying than the nameable. You see that in, there was this great Blair Witch Project. Mm -hmm. Terrifying movie. Oh, I it's thought it was scary. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's unnamed. There's nothing terrible happens in that movie. It's all the unnameable. It's like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And no matter how terrible the actuality is, it's rarely as terrible as your imagination. Because your imagination, like it's an old thing. It's seen a lot of terrible things in the history of life. Like it can put monsters everywhere. And so it's almost always better. It might be better without exception to name the thing, no matter how terrible it is. And if you can't name it, what that means is that you're, you're telling yourself that you're so terrified that you can't bring your attention to bear on it. And that makes you, you're the loser, instantly. If it's so terrifying that you cannot face it, it's won. You, you write in the book, there is no faith and no courage and no sacrifice in doing what is expedient. What do you say to those viewers that don't pursue their dreams and are locked in their careers? because they are too afraid to take risks and pursue something mm. meaningful. Well, the first thing I would say is, well, you should be afraid of taking risks and pursuing something meaningful. But you should be more afraid of staying where you are if it's making you miserable. It's like the first thing you want to do is dispense with the idea that you get to have any, any permanent security outside of your ability to contend and adapt. It's the same issue with children. It's like. You're paying a price by sitting there being miserable. You might say, well, the devil I know is better than the one I don't. It's like, don't be so sure of that. The clock is ticking. Yeah, but and if you're miserable in your job now and you change nothing, in five years you'll be much more miserable and you'll be a lot older. But and isn't so it a luxury to pursue what is meaningful? Our viewers have mortgages, they have children, yeah. they have payments and loans. It's well, a luxury to pursue because we, we lack the resources. Well, I don't think, I don't remember now, I'm not talking about what makes you happy. It's a luxury to pursue what makes you happy. It's a moral obligation to pursue what you find meaningful. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It might require sacrifice. If you need to change your job too, let's say you have a family and, 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 and children and, and a mortgage, you have responsibilities. You've already picked up those responsibilities. You don't just get to walk away scot-free and say, well, I don't like my job, I quit. That's no strategy. But what you might have to do is you think, well, this job is killing my soul. All right, so what do I have to do about that? Well, I have to look for another job. Well, no one wants to hire me. It's like, okay, maybe you need to educate yourself more. Maybe you need to update your, your curriculum vitae, your resume. Maybe you need to overcome your fear of being interviewed. Maybe you need to sharpen your social skills. Like, you, you have to think about these things strategically. If you're going to switch careers, you have to do it like an intelligent, responsible person. That might take you a couple of years of, of, of effort to do properly. I mean, I've, I've dealt with hundreds of people in my clinical and consulting practice, and we set a goal, we develop a vision, and work towards it, and it, it, things inevitably get better for people. So it's not a luxury, it's, it's difficult. It's a moral responsibility, and it isn't happiness. It's, it's not, the pursuit isn't for happiness. It's a moral responsibility mm. to pursue what is meaningful. Absolutely. Yeah. The, us human beings. You, you're not after um, the bubbles of bliss that Dostoevsky described in, in Notes from Underground. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge, and the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure, you want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world, and you take the slings and arrows of fate. And you make yourself stronger while you're doing so. And you might fail, and fortune might do you in. But it's your best bet. And, you know, people have also, people have, had, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people, you know. You're doing fine in life, and then you get cancer. And then six months later, you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend. And you develop by contending and you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man. That's something to do. Life is difficult. And you cannot protect your children. 
what you can do is prepare them and you can prepare them to be strong and courageous and truthful and resilient and reciprocal in their interactions with other people. And that means you equip them for what life will be, which is at minimum a series of difficult challenges and, and often more than that because of course people go through very difficult times in their lives and a, a resilient person is capable of standing up to things in the face of fear and moving forward voluntarily, convinced of their own competence and ability to prevail. And so the primary, your primary goal as a parent, apart from facilitating your child's social desirability, which is a major obligation on your part, is to encourage your children and to, and I mean that literally, to instill in them a sense of courage in the face of the difficulties of life and not to protect them from that. We don't even want to be protected from those difficulties because a major part of life and its meaning is the, the challenge that comes with confronting difficulties. The baboon here, who's supposed to be basically just a fool when the story was first written, he turned into what's essentially a shaman across time. And the, so he represents the self from the Jungian perspective. Now the self is everything you could be across time. So imagine that there's you and there's the potential inside you, whatever that is, you know. And potential is an interesting idea because it represents something that isn't yet real, yet we act like it's real. Because people will say to you, you should live up to your potential. And that potential is part what you could be if you interacted with the world in a manner that would gain you the most information, right? Because you build yourself out of the information in the Piagetian sense. But it's deeper than that too, because we know that if you take yourself and you put yourself in a new environment, new genes turn on in your nervous system. They encode for new proteins. And so you're full of biological potential that won't be realized unless you move yourself around in the world into different challenging circumstances, and that'll turn on different circuits. So it's not merely that you're incorporating information from the outside world in the constructivist sense. It's that by exposing yourself to different environments, you put different physiological demands on, on yourself all the way down to the genetic level, and that manifests new elements of you. And so one of the things that happens to people, and this is a very common cultural notion, is that you should go on a pilgrimage at some point to somewhere central, and that would be, say, like the rock in the... Pride Rock and the Lion King, because you take yourself out of your dopey little village, and that's just the little bounded you that everyone knows and that isn't very expanded, and then you go somewhere dark and dangerous to the central place, and while you do that, you have adventures and they toughen you and pull more out of you, like partly because you're becoming informed, which means information. It means you're becoming more organized at every level of analysis, but there's also more of you too. My primary motive as a clinical psychologist and educator is to help individuals live more meaningful and productive lives in harmony with their families and their community. That's my motive. And the evidence for that, I think, is well, if people go online, and first of all, you can watch the lectures and decide for yourself, but you can also go there's, I suspect, probably maybe 250,000 people have commented on the lectures and their effects on them. And so that's what people say. I'm watching the lectures. Yeah. I'm trying to develop a vision for my life. I'm trying to become more responsible. And it's really helping. And that's, and that's what I hear all the time when I do these public lectures, like, which, which aren't political. But when we gain success, we raise the bar. We yes. set our ambitions higher. I mean, what is your end game? What do you want? That's all. That's what I want. I want, I want to help as many individuals as possible become more courageous, more truthful, and more engaged in the pursuit of individual, familial, and social harmony. That's what I want. You're doing a great job of Thank modeling you. courage in the face of fire. Well, there's something I'd like to say, maybe in closing, about courage. People say that to me, and, you know, I, I don't think it's exactly right. There's a, there's a line in the Old Testament, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I think it's more like that. It's not that I'm courageous, it's that I'm afraid of the right things. So when I made my videos, it wasn't like that it didn't make me nervous. But... I was less nervous about going back to bed and not saying what I had to say than I was about making the videos because I know where this is going. I don't want to go there. And so it's, it's not so much courage. It's that it's a matter of, I, it's, it's, it's less risky to say something 
than to remain silent when you know there's something to be said. I know that to be the case. And so lots of times in life, it's like there's no pathway forward that's going to shield you from risk. You get to pick this risk or you get to pick this risk. And I think I picked the lesser risk. And that might be wise, but I'm not so sure it's courageous. The more radical the necessary change, the more pain that accompanies it. Like the more opportunity as well. But, and a lot of what we learn, we learn painfully. And so it's not surprising that people shrink away from learning. We learn in pain and anxiety very frequently. Everyone knows that. It's like the things that really, that you really learned in life. It's like, it was no joy, man. Like it took you out. And so the fact that people flee from that is hardly surprising. But it doesn't help, that's the thing. It just stores up the catastrophe for later. And so the better, the better idea is to eat a little poison every day so that you don't have to overdose in a month. It's something like that. And it is the case that I think because you don't, you aren't forced to, first of all, you don't learn unless you're forced to learn. I know there's alternatives to that. There's the voluntary search for knowledge. And, and that's a fine thing. And that is an antidote to this. But apart from that, speaking more practically, you tend not to learn unless you're forced to learn. And it's, and what you tend to learn by force are difficult lessons. And so people are very prone to not, <coughs> to not seek that out. It's not surprising, but it's because they don't understand the consequences very well. You know, you, you, it's because maybe it's because they're convinced that there's some way of forestalling the necessary learning and there isn't any way of forestalling it. All you do is make it worse in the future. You make yourself smaller and you make the lesson harder. And so that's why in so many religious doctrines, there's emphasis on humility. You know, and humility isn't to debase yourself. It's to understand that you don't know enough so that your life isn't going to be miserable. And so every chance you get to grab something new that will help you along your way, you should take it as fast as you can. But you have to have a very tragic, I would say, view of reality and also a harsh one because it's not just tragedy, it's also malevolence. You have to understand that those are waiting for you and that makes you desperate enough to learn and that might be make you desperate enough to fall out of your ideology. But that's, that's a hard way of looking at the world. So one of the things I've yeah. been talking to my audiences about is the relationship between responsibility and meaning, which mm -hmm. is, the, uh, uh, what would you say, it's a, it's a constant refrain in the book. It's mm -hmm. one of its underlying um, um, messages, let's say, or themes is a better way of thinking about it. Um, you know, if, if you start with the presumption that there's a baseline of suffering in life and that that can be uh, exaggerated by as a consequence of human failing, as a consequence of malevolence and betrayal and self-betrayal and deceit and all those things that we do to each other and ourselves that we know that aren't good, that amplifies the suffering. That's sort of the baseline against which you have to work. And, and, and it's contemplation of that often that makes people hopeless and depressed and anxious and overwhelmed and yeah. all of that, and, and, and they have the reasons. But you need something to put up against that. And what you put up against that is meaning. Meaning is actually the instinct that helps you guide yourself through that catastrophe. And most of that meaning is to be found in the adoption of responsibility. So if you think, for example, if you think about the people that you admire, yeah. well, you think about when you have a clear conscience first, because yeah. that's a good thing to aim at, which is something different than happiness, right? Um, a clear conscience is different than happiness. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. That's you're not better. Like guilting yourself, you're not feeling bad about yourself. That's right. You feel yeah. that you've justified clean. you've justified your existence, yeah. right? And so you're not waking up at three in the morning in a cold sweat thinking about all the terrible things that you've involved yourself in. Mm. What you, you said know. to someone that you shouldn't have said, mm -hmm. or how you acted, or mm -hmm. lied. Or what or opportunity deceit. you lost, or or, mm -hmm. or or yeah, or or the things that you've that you've let go that you should have capitalized on mm -hmm. and all of that. And so if you think about the times when you're at peace with yourself with regards to how you're conducting yourself in the world, it's almost always conditions under which you've adopted responsibility, mm. right? At least the most, the most guilt I think that you can experience perhaps is the sure knowledge that you're not even taking care of yourself so that you're leaving that responsibility to other people because that's pretty pathetic and I, unless you're psychopathic 
and you know, and, and you're living a parasitical life, and, mm. and that that characterizes a very small minority of people, and an even smaller minority think that's justifiable. But most of the time, you're in guilt and shame because you're not, you're you're not. Not only are you not taking care of yourself, let's say, so someone else has to, but you're not living up to your full potential, and so there's an existential weight that goes along with that. People came to my website because they were interested in, well, before the political stuff blew up, I had a million views on YouTube, which is not nothing. A million of anything is a lot. But then when the political scandal started to break, yeah, yeah then people came for them but stayed for the content. And so, and that's been really love. useful. Yeah. yeah, well, it's, it's been, love. well, and it's not that surprising. Well, you know, because of yeah. what you do, it's like peop, there's a great hunger for information that is practical and useful and that helps people find meaning in their lives and orient themselves. There's a great hunger for that. And most of my lectures were derived from solid psychology, some of it experimental, some of it biological, some of it from, from, from the domains of neuroscience, a lot of it from great clinicians. It's not surprising that people find it helpful because, yeah. well, great <laughs> clinicians were great because they were really helpful. And so to distill that and to offer it to people in a digestible form, to have that have a good effect on them, well, that's, that's what you'd expect. That's what the whole discipline is about. Our topic is the rising tide of compelled speech in Canada. It's a fucking lie! But they... No such thing as compelled speech! Uh, I tell you what to do! Narcissism at work, by the way. You know, to hijack, a, to hijack an event like this that other people put time and effort into and to use the, their, their civility of the crowd and the civility of the organizers as an excuse to blatantly yell out your ill-informed opinions is no way to conduct a civil dialogue. It's absolutely appalling. The people who do that should be embarrassed. These people are not your friends. Let me see. You know, that's, that, that, and, and mark my words, that's the sounds of the barbarians pounding at the gates. Right. Yeah, that's all I'll tell you again too. That use of inchoate, what would you call it? Inchoate sensation is the best formulation of their argument. And there's not much difference between knocking on the doors and knocking on you. So keep that in mind. It's not amusing. There's nothing to it. There's nothing for it. The thing that's also quite appalling is that there's no evidence whatsoever that the people who are conducting these protests know what it is that they're protesting against. You know, I was in... I, I, I was in the midst of a discussion attempting to make the case that it's freedom of speech that's, that is what people who have nothing still have, right? So if you look at the tyrannical structure of our society, let's say the people at the top have access to means of communication. Everyone knows that. It's the people at the bottom who have the right to say what they think, however badly they say it. 
that enables them to get a toehold into the system and to, and to make their suffering known. That's what freedom of speech is for. And so, like, what's the protest against that? And I'll tell you, you know, that the radical neo-Marxist types, they speak the language of power, and that's what they're speaking right now. And if you want to live in a world where everyone speaks the language of power, then just let them do what they're doing and see what happens. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not a pretty road. And you're all in a position, you're all in a situation in your life now where you have to make decisions about these sorts of things. Like, is this the sort of institution that you want this to be? The idea that in some sense you're an eternal victim. Well, there's a truth in that, given that nature is conspiring to destroy you and will be successful in the end, that you're undermined by your own society at the same time you're buttressed by it, and that you're a, a target of your own malevolence and that of others. I mean, so there's plenty, there's, there's a triad of tragic and malevolent forces that are aimed directly at your heart, and that's always the case. But, but to not take responsibility for that and to attribute, attribute to that to, to a cosmic injustice or a soci sociological injustice in some sense that's aimed particularly at you, that's somehow the fault of others, is to miss the great adventure of your life. In that adoption of that adventurous mode of being, there's a deep meaning to be found, right? A meaning maybe that transcends just you, that involves your family and that involves your community and maybe even the destiny of humanity itself. But there's nothing about that that's secure or easy and very little that has to do with happiness. The, the idea that your problems should be solved for you let's say, and that it's unfair that you have them. Well, it, 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 it's attractive in that there's nothing for you to do except complain, but, but it's horrifying in that there's nothing for you to do except complain. The difficulty is actually, the funny thing is, is the difficulty is actually the destiny. And it is insanely difficult, but Maybe you're insanely up to the task. I've watched people do very difficult things, like people who work in palliative care wards. So all they're ever dealing with is pain and death, right? And they can do it. They get up in the morning, they go to work, and they take care of those people. They lose people on a weekly basis, and yet they can do it. And what that shows is that if you turn around and you confront the suffering voluntarily, you find out that you are way tougher than you think. It's not that life is better than you think. Life is as harsh as you think. It might even be worse. But you are way tougher than you think if you turn around and confront it. And so then what you discover is that there's a spirit within you that, pursues, that can pursue something meaningful, that has the resilience and the strength to contend properly with the catastrophe of existence without becoming bitter. That's actually the central. So, mm. and then I would say that's one of the central themes of 12 Rules for Life is that make no mistake about it. Like, the first noble truth of Buddhism, life is suffering. This is true, and it's worse than that because it's suffering contaminated by malevolence. That's the baseline. But, and so that's very pessimistic, but the optimistic part is that you are so damn tough, you can actually not only deal with that, you can improve it. Mm. It's like, hmm, oh, well that's a horrible situation, but it turns out that I'm armed for the task. Well, that's, that's a great thing for people to know. And I do believe, I think the fact that we're armed for the task is even more true than the fact that life is catastrophe contaminated by malevolence. We're stronger than things are terrible. So, and things are pretty terrible. So that means we're pretty damn strong. <laughs> wow. Yes, it's a very good thing to know. And it's not naive optimism. Yeah. It's a very different thing. It's like, no, things are terrible. They're brutal. And you are so damn tough, you can't believe it. If you don't have a goal, a transcendent goal, say, something that's beyond you, then you don't have any positive emotion. And that's not good because you have plenty of negative emotion. And, and that's, that's the problem with fundamental claims of meaninglessness too in life, that it, it's, this, it's the philosophical error that's made by nihilists, let's say, who say, well, life is meaningless. It's like, well, if you're a nihilist, genu genuinely, you've lost all hope, your life isn't meaningless, it's just unbearably miserable. And that's, and that's a form of meaning. You know, that suffering is a form of meaning. And you can try to argue yourself out of that with your nihilistic rationalizations, but that is not going to work. You need a transcendent goal 
in order to withstand the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Values aren't created, they're discovered. And they're discovered through a consultation with the parts of yourself that you're not conscious of, that you're not fully conscious of, that aren't articulated, that aren't fully articulated elements of your primary personality. You have to discover what your values are and you're informed about that, well, partly by other people who will object if your values aren't appropriate, but certainly by a dialogue with yourself and with your conscience. That's, that's a very important thing to know. It's part of the reason why I think that you need to tell the truth, because you're forced to negotiate with yourself to operate properly in the world. And if you've warped yourself, let's say, or some elements of yourself by engaging in self-deception and lies, and, and you're not now, because of that, you're not who you could be, and you don't live in the world as you should live in it, then when you discuss with yourself what your value should be, it will be as if you're discussing it with someone that you can't trust. And that's, that's not good. Like, you, you can't afford that. Life is difficult and it contains many pitfalls and unless you're careful and you sort yourself out properly and you aim high and walk on the straight and narrow path you don't have a hope of understanding where you should be and at what time when the crisis hits you, you love to quote this line this nietzsche line that anyone who has a why to live for can endure almost any how yeah. what's your why what is driving you? See, when people read history, they, they either read it as a detached observer or they tend to read it as, well, maybe the heroic, the her heroic protagonist. People like to imagine that they would be Schindler in Schindler's List, but that's wrong. So because the probability that you'll be the perpetrator is much higher, especially merely the perpetrator who's ensconced in silence when silence is not the appropriate thing. So I wanted to, having figured out what constituted hell and the pathway to that, which would be, I suppose, the cowardice that produces, the cowardice and resentment that produces either complicitness in those events or failure to oppose them when they emerge, I wanted to understand what the opposite of that was. Because I think that's what needs to be learned from what happened in the 20th century. And so that's why I wrote Maps of Meaning, was to understand that and to lay out what the opposite was. And then that turned out to be extremely helpful to me and then to the people I started to teach about that. Because it's useful to know what the opposite of hell is. And I've been teaching those things to people since 1993. So that's 25 years. And the response from the students has always been the same sort of response that I'm getting now, um, absent some of the negative uh, characterizations, let's say, which, which have emerged for, for, for particular reasons. But the students have always said one of two things, and, and this is the vast majority of them. This isn't cherry-picked responses. It's been the same everywhere. Um, they tell me, and th this is the same response I get from my audiences now too, is they say, you've given me words to explain things, to explain and understand things that I always knew to be true, or I was in a very dark place for one of the seven reasons that people might be in a dark place, alcohol or drugs or failure of relationships or lack of vision or nihilism or, or hopelessness or depression or anxiety, you know, all the pitfalls that people can encounter. And I've been developing a vision for my life and trying to adopt responsibility and trying to be careful with what I say and things are way better. And that's what drives me. What's your definition of greatness? Well, greatness is what reveals itself when you, when you attempt to formulate, when you attempt to carefully articulate and live out what you believe to be true. It just happens because there isn't anything more powerful than truth, right? That's the antidote to suffering truth right so it's a strange thing because you think well yeah it produces a lot of suffering too it's like <laughs> yeah in the short term they say do you believe in god let's say and my response to that always is well i don't know what you mean when you ask me that question so i don't know how to answer it i don't know what you mean by believe but i can tell you something that i believe and i would say this is a, a way of speaking symbolically i do believe so I was thinking the other day, a week ago, I was thinking about 
I had this little fantasy that entered my mind. I was thinking about St. Joseph's Oratorio in Montreal. And St. Joseph's Oratorio is a very large religious building. It's one of the biggest cathedral-like structures in the world. And it's set on the hill on Mount, Mount Royal, and it's set up where it can catch the sun. You know, so it's an image of the heavenly city on the hill, right? It's an image of the structures that we strive to create. That's what it is, in, independent of its specifically Christian or religious function. That's what it stands for symbolically. Okay, so it's the city on the hill. It's, it's what we're striving towards when we walk uphill in life. Okay, now, the way the, the, the oratorio is structured, there's hundreds of steps leading to it up the front. And in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of people who had physical disabilities came there, and they struggled up the step on their crutches, and many of them left their crutches in the oratorio. You can see hundreds of them if you go there. It's quite an interesting sight. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about what that meant, and this is what it means. It means that, you know, everyone has their disabilities, let's say, and I know that some people are far more terribly affected than other people. I'm perfectly aware of that. But the question is, what do you do about that? And what you do is you, you set yourself up on your damn crutches and you struggle up the bloody hill. That's what you do. And you struggle up the hill towards the kingdom of God. That's what you do. Because the alternative is to descend into the abyss. That's the alternative. And then so to say, well, do you believe? It's like, I believe that you should struggle uphill towards the city of God on your crutches. That's what you should do. That's the opposite of the descent into the abyss. And so that's, that's at the foundation of our civilization, that idea. Well, argue with it if you will. See if you can figure out why that's not an acceptable idea. Maybe you should help someone struggle up the hill. Perhaps you should. You know, you can lend a hand to someone, although you don't want to take the burden away from them entirely because there's something noble about struggling up the damn hill, right? There's something, that's adventure. That's the call to proper being. It's like, well, we don't need to forget this. You know, we don't need to forget it. The universities have been there since time immemorial to try to push that idea forward through the generations. And everyone needs to know that idea. That's what gives your life not happiness. Forget about that. If it comes, well, great, accept it. Dignity, nobility, character, truth, responsibility, beauty. Honor. Those are the things to aim for. No, and I've had journalists say, well, what makes you think that your right to free speech trumps the right of someone to not be offended? And I think that's really the level of our political discourse. Okay, so we'll run a little thought experiment. So I'm talking to one person, I'm talking to you, and the rule is I don't get to offend you. Okay, maybe we can still have a discussion about something difficult. But let's say I'm talking to 10 people and, and about an important thing. Now I have to make sure that I don't say anything, despite the fact that this is an important and contentious issue, that I don't say anything that offends even one of those 10 people. Okay, maybe I can even manage that. What if I'm talking to 1,000 people? There's gonna be someone in that 1,000 people, there's gonna be someone who's offended at the mere fact that I exist. So it's an impossible standard. It's like, well, you can't say anything offensive. Okay, fine, then you can't say anything. Okay. So what? You don't get to say anything because no one should be offended. Well, then you don't get to think. Well, what happens if you don't think? Well, then you can't negotiate your way through the future and you fall into a pit and so does everyone else. So that's where that all ends up. You can't say offensive things. Equals, you cannot negotiate your way properly through the future. Equals, everyone suffers. Well, that's a bad that's a bad strategy. So, and it's, and it's all covered up with, well, you know, it'd be better if no one was ever offended. It's like, well, who thinks that? You know how naive you have to be to think that? How you have to be pathologically naive, which is the kind of naive that you could have grown out of, but you willfully refused to because you weren't willing to see what was in front of your face. And then you impose that blind naivety on everyone else because you don't want to allow them to upset your like rosy view, your rosy view of yourself and the world. There's, it's just, there's no end to how terrible that is. I made a decision when the computers started to become omnipresent, and so that would have been about 1993, that I was gonna spend a year, and that was the first year that I was teaching in Boston, pretty much doing nothing but figuring out how 
Intel 486s worked. And it meant there was a lot of other things that I had to put on hold, but I did become a competent computer user. And I was, I'm pretty fast, but you know, my son, it's just annoying as hell to watch him on the computer and on the phone because, and my graduate students as well, because they're so much faster than me that it's not even funny. And I'm not really accustomed to being slower than someone else in the room. And so, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, if I had children now, the one thing I would bloody well make sure that they knew was how to use a computer, how to program, man. Because if you're smart and you can use a computer, you are so much smarter than you are if you're just smart that it's not even funny. Mm. You know, and you talk to people, you see this in Silicon Valley all the time, you talk to people who are expert computer users, they are so bloody powerful, it is just beyond belief. So, and that, that's gonna do nothing but expand, right? Because Moore's Law is not dead and computers are doubling in power every 18 months. And, and so, and who the hell knows where that's going to go. The world this way, you can think about it as your orderly little plan, that's a place, and you can think about it as the place that things that disrupt your plan comes from. That's another place. This is a bigger place than this, because there's an endless number of things that can disrupt your plan, and only a tiny number of them that can, you know, that will help you work it out. So part of the question then, too, is like, are you the friend of your plan, or are you the friend of the thing that disrupts your plan? And I would say, you should work to become the friend of the thing that disrupts your plan, because there's a lot of that. And then if you become the friend of the thing that disrupts your plan, then you, be, you start to develop strength in proportion to the, to the disruptive force. And that's really what you want. You want to be able to implement your plan, obviously, but you want to be able to take on the consequences of error and learn from it. And then, then you win constantly, because even if something goes sideways, you think there's something to be derived from this. That's wisdom, fundamentally. Conscientiousness is a plan of life you'd like to have. And, and you do that partly by referring to social norms. That's more or less rescuing your father from the belly of the whale. But the way, other way you do that is by having a little conversation with yourself about as, as if you don't really know who you are because you know what you're like. You won't do what you're told. You won't do what you tell yourself to do. You must have noticed that. It's like you're a bad employee and a worse boss. And, and both of those work you know, for you. You don't know what you want to do, and then when you tell yourself what to do, you don't do it anyways. You should fire yourself and find someone else to be. But, but you know, my point is, is that you have to understand that you're not your own servant, so to speak. You're someone that you have to negotiate with, and, that's, and you, you're someone that you want to present the opportunity of having a good life to. And that's hard for people, because they don't like themselves very much. So, you know, they're always like cracking the whip and then procrastinating and cracking the whip and then procrastinating. And it's like, God, it's so boring and it's such a pathetic way of spending your time. I don't know what percentage of human effort is spent in counterproductive activity. You know, I, I'm, I'm not an absolute cynic about that, but I mean, when I talk to undergraduates, I ask them, you know, how much time do you waste every day by your own reckoning and it's somewhere between five and eight hours you know it's a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of time well i usually walk through i walk the stu students through an economic analysis of that i said well you know why don't you value your time at fifty dollars an hour and calculate for yourself just exactly what you're doing to your future by your inability to discipline yourself it's worth thinking through the other thing you should do if you're not very industrious industrious is discipline yourself and so what do you do with that Eat three times a day at regular meal times. That's a good thing to practice because that starts to put some stability into your life. Get up at the same time. I would highly recommend all those young people out there who are listening, like you want to get a jump on life, get the hell out of bed in the morning. You know, as I've got older, I've got up earlier and earlier. Now that's partly because you don't need as much sleep, but it's also partly because I've got more and more disciplined. Like get up early in the morning and get your things done. Man, learn to get up at six in the morning and you'll be one deadly creature, especially if you can get to work. You'll have half your damn day done by the time other people haul their sorry asses out of bed. And so that's a massive, massive advantage. Look, Will Ferrell, um, Warren Ferrell, not the comedian, Warren Ferrell, the author, he outlined data in Why Men Earn More, which is a book I would recommend, by the way, showing that if you work 13% longer hours, you make 40% more money. It's non-linear. So you think, why is that? Well, imagine you had 10 employees. 
and one of them works an extra 10 percent it's not much well how often is that person going to be promoted assuming you have a clue as a boss it's like you're going to look at the 10 people and you're going to think oh that guy's always here like 45 minutes early it's like why don't we give him the promotion obviously right so these tie these small edges that you can manage like that work an extra 10 percent or extra 13 percent have non-proportional payoffs that's part of the Pareto distribution so get get your sleep cycle organized so you get up in the morning learn how to do it no excuses i'm too tired in the morning i don't like mornings who cares that's not relevant it's like discipline yourself so you can manage it schedule your meals because that's a good disciplinary routine and then learn to use a calendar like google calendar most of you many of you out there do not use a calendar okay a calendar is not a prison and it's not a tyrant not if you use it properly a calendar keeps anxiety at bay it makes sure that you do what you need to do which is important because otherwise you fall behind but if you use it properly it's also helps you plan what you want to do so i could say well lay out your damn calendar and design the days you would like to have that's what your calendar is for so you can put in all sorts of things in there you want to do and that would be good for you and that's a really good a really good way to start being more industrious make a plan you need a plan for three years you need a plan for the next year you need a plan for the next six months you need a plan for the next three months you need a plan for the week you need a plan for the day you need a plan for the hour all of that all of that i make lists constantly of what i have to do and they're like daily weekly monthly yearly right now i can't look out more than about six months you know because my life is too complicated and chaotic but but you need a vision of who you could be what character you could have three to five years out you can't go much farther than that because life is too unpredictable i think to make vision that's longer term than that subject to there's too, too much chance associated with it to spend a lot of time on maybe you can stretch it to five years and in rare cases you can have a 10-year goal but it has to be pretty low resolution but you want plans at all those levels of resolution you want to write the things down and what because what are you going to do you're going to stumble around and get get what you need you're going to stumble around and be useful to other people and it's useful to be useful to other people you know they want to work with you then they want to do things with you they want to have you around they trust you they open up opportunities for you and if you stumble around like you're blind you're not going to get anywhere and then you're going to suffer and then you're going to be bitter and then you're going to be cruel so that's a that's hell that's a bad outcome before before you can be a painter who can paint what's beyond mere memory you you have to inculcate that discipline skill and a lot of that is painful repetition and hard grinding work it's the sacrifice of the present for the future but once you manage that then things open up and, and virtually everything you learn of value is like that's very 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 difficult to learn to write and there's arbitrary arbitrary rules that you have to follow and bind yourself to mm. and while you're learning those rules the probability that you have any creative freedom to speak of or any facility with the rules is very low you're a you're a rank beginner and and even to some degree whatever creativity you have is going to have to be stifled while you're passing through that that keyhole but if you pass through it then something massive opens up on the other side and it is definitely the case that disciplinary institutions universities are exactly that is their places of guidance and and their places to encourage people to develop the discipline that's necessary to see beyond the discipline i mean that's why we have disciplines right i mean the words aren't there by accident you have to narrow yourself first and then you can broaden outward and so that's and that's part of the process of maturation that, that part of the that's part of the sacrifice of childhood say in childhood you're nothing but potential but it's not realized and you don't know how to realize it and so then the question is well how do you get to a point where you realize the potential and the answer is you sacrifice almost all of it to a single direction this is nietzsche's commentary on the catholic church he's a great admirer of the catholic church despite the fact that he was also a radical crit critic uh, critic of christianity he said the Cat see the thing about the catholic church is that it forced everything to be interpreted within a single explanatory framework and that was a discipline and once that discipline was established then the disciplined mind could explode in every direction which is precisely what happened 
And so, and, and, and that's the thing about growing up is that when you're a teenager and a young adult, you have to sacrifice everything you could have been as a child to be the one thing that you're aiming at. But then that opens up and, and the universities are part and parcel of that process. And you need the guidance because the, the, the library is too large to wander through it unaided. When I was a teenager, I mean, I, I did, God, if I had to write a book about the stupid things I did when I was a teenager, it'd be a very thick book. And it'd be a worse book if there were photographs accompanying it. Um, and, you know, but, but I had this advantage that young people today don't have, which was, well, when my day of stupidity was over, I could go home and it was not there. You know, like, it wasn't on Twitter, it wasn't on Facebook, um, there yep. wasn't 20 of my friends communicating to me about, you know, what foolish thing I did at the party the night before, and, um, and young people now, they're just followed by paparazzi, essentially, constantly, and, and I've watched that with the young teenage daughters of many of my friends, because uh, my kids were a little too old for that to have actually have happened to them, but God, it's miserable, and um, we know that there is some relationship between the amount of time people use Facebook, for example, and their mental health, which means the more they use Facebook, the more depressed they are. And it might be that the depression is driving the Facebook use, but the causal pathway seems to be the other way around, which is, you know, it's just playing that unbelievably exposed social game. That's hard on people, and these aren't trivial technologies, you know? I mean, they're, they're, they're transforming the way we communicate with one another, and that's, and they're, they're completely uncontrolled experiments. We have no idea what the medium or long-term consequences are going to be, and we'll never find out either because, of course, the communication landscape changes so quickly that by the time you get adapted to one communication technology, another one has come along that's even more confusing that you now have to master, and so... Well, that's why it's necessary for everyone to develop their own modicum of wisdom, I believe, because I, I don't know how else we're going to be able to deal with this technological transformation that's going to come across, is already coming across us like a tidal wave. And, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. The, the people in Silicon Valley have plans that, well, that, that make you think that the whole place should probably be bombed just for the safety of the rest of us. You know, because there's, there's tremendous danger in that rapid acceleration of machine intelligence, and, and we have no, we have absolutely no idea where that's headed. So, and maybe it'll be great. It's, it's possible that it'll be great, but power cuts both ways. So, hopefully, we can, we can control it with our wisdom, and that's pretty much up to each of you to put your lives together so you can make good decisions. You can learn to kind of watch yourself like you're watching a stranger, but you have to adopt a position. It's a position of radical humility, I would say, both, both humility in two senses. So one sense would be the humility of recognizing your ignorance. So you have to understand that you don't know who you are. And that's not easy to understand because you think you know, but then, you know, you remember... You can't control yourself very well. You're not very disciplined. You're full of flaws. Maybe you don't know yourself as well as you think. But it's hard to get low enough to understand how deeply it is the case that you are ignorant about who you are. Now, there's an upside to that, too, which also is that you're also ignorant about who you could be. And so the discovery of that, you know, is some reward for the horror of determining who you actually are. People can tolerate inequality, so to speak, or even revel in it, let's say, if they believe that the unequal outcome is deserved. I mean, look at how people respond to sports heroes. You know, everyone, no one goes to a sports event and boos the star, even though he or she is paid much better and attracts the lion's share of the attention, hopefully not in too narcissistic a manner. People can celebrate success, but they do have to believe that the game is fair, and, 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 and the game needs to be fair, because otherwise the hierarchy becomes tyrannical.
You know, Silicon Valley tends to be liberal. Every, everyone knows that. And the reason for that is that there's a tremendous number of entrepreneurs there. And entrepreneurs tend to be high in openness and lower in conscientiousness. So they're creative, but they're also willing to break rules, you know, which you kind of have to do yep. often. Hopefully not to a criminal extent, but you have to... Yeah, well, you know, it's tricky when you're trying to establish something new because look at a company like Uber, you know, they had to bend the rules to, to be successful. And those companies that have rented those scooters out and put them on the streets everywhere, you know, they just kind of went ahead and did it. It's not something an orderly person would do because they'd ask for permission. Whereas the people who started these scooter rental companies just said, well, huh, what'll happen if we put them everywhere? And the answer was that seemed to work, but you know, you have to have a rule-breaking proclivity in order to manage that. Take a bit of a look at yourself and think about what's not so good that you could improve, that you should improve by your own standards, and that you would improve. You know, and set yourself a little goal. Um, you know, maybe you're not studying at all at, at, at your university. Or maybe you're, maybe you're at work and you've got this stack of paper there, you know, and you haven't looked at that damn stack for like a month and you know that you should be and you're bo bothering yourself at night because you're avoiding that. It's like maybe think, well, I've avoided that stack of paper completely for one month. I'm quite a coward when it comes to whatever snakes might be hidden in that stack of paper. How about tomorrow I just like put that stack of paper in front of me on my desk and I like... I glance through it for 15 seconds. See if I can do that. It's like, well, you set yourself a goal of improvement. You know, it's a humble goal because really, are you such a coward that the best that you can bloody well manage after a month of avoidance is 15 seconds of exposure to a stack of paper? You know, it could easily be. You've been avoiding it. So you're obviously afraid of it. And so the situation could be that dismal and dire and you might think, well, geez, it's no bomb to my ego. It's no, it's it's no, it's not fostering the the strength of my ego to recognize myself, someone who could only withstand 15 seconds of exposure to that thing I'm afraid of. And so that's a form of humility too. It's like there's things you could do to improve, and you know what they are. And there's small steps that you could take that you might take that would put you in that direction. And then the question is, are you big enough to take those small steps? You know, are you capable of grappling with the fact that you're fundamentally flawed to the point where you have to break things down into almost childlike steps in order to manage them? And the answer to that is, yeah, you are. And that's the lot of, I don't know if it's the lot of everyone. Most people have things they avoid, you know, and they're afraid of. So I would say to some degree, it's the lot of everyone. People vary in the degree to which they've conquered that. And you do meet people from time to time who are extraordinarily disciplined. But most of the time, they've got disciplined in exactly this manner. It's through slow, incremental improvement. And then you challenge yourself. It's like, well, could I do this? That would be better. And then you find out. And then you think, well, is there something slightly larger and more challenging that I could do that would be better? And, and you try it and you find out. And as you try it and you find out, generally you get better at it and you can take on larger and larger challenges. In any case, people do waste a lot of time and they, are, they also act counterproductively a lot of the time. Regardless, we do make progress and, 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 and we can thrive under the difficult conditions that make up our lives, and we can resist the malevolence that entices us. That's within our power, and we don't know the limits to that. And we also know that it's better to, we all know this, that it's better to live courageously than cowardly. Everyone knows that. That's what you teach people that you love. And, and, and we know that it's better to live truthfully than in deceit. And you can tell that too, because that's also what you tell people that you love. And we know that you should pick up your responsibility and move forward. Everyone knows that. It's, it's part of our intrinsic moral nature. And that nature is there. 
it's not difficult to communicate to people about this. Like, everyone knows that you wake up at three in the morning when you've left, let your life go off the rails and that you berate yourself for your uselessness and your cruelty and your failure to take, op to take the opportunities that are in front of you. And if you were the master in your own house, in some sense, the captain of your own destiny, if there was no intrinsic nature, well, that would never happen. You'd just let yourself off the hook. There'd be no voice of conscience tormenting you. But no one escapes from that. And what that indicates is, to me is that, at least psychologically, we live in a universe that's characterized by a moral dimension. And we understand that well. And that moral failings have consequences. And, th and that they're not trivial. They destroy you. They destroy your family. They destroy your community. And, and you can tell people that. And they listen because they know. They don't know they know. That's the thing. And maybe that's the thing about being an, an intellectual. You, know, you have the opportunity to articulate ideas that other people know, they embody, but they can't articulate. And that's what people tell me. You know, they say, well, you help me give words to things that I always knew to be true but couldn't say. Or, or they say, I've been trying to put some of your precepts into practice, responsibility being a main one, vision another, honesty, I, I suppose, bringing up the pack and saying, and this is the fun part of doing all of this. Fun is a weak word that it's, 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 a, it's the remarkable part of doing all this. I mean, I have people tell me constantly wherever I go, it's so delightful that you know, they were in a pretty dark place and they tell me why and there's plenty of dark places in the world and they decided, well, maybe they were gonna develop a bit of a vision and take a bit more responsibility and start telling the truth and putting some effort into something. You know, we kind of have this idea that while well, you're free as a child and then you, let me see if I, can, if I can put this properly, that you have a certain delightful, wonderful, positive freedom as a child and then that's given up as you approach adulthood. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a lot of potential as a child, but none of that is capable of manifesting itself as freedom before you become disciplined. And discipline is a matter of the imposition of order, and the order is necessary, especially for people who are hopeless and nihilistic. And lots of people are hopeless and nihilistic. Way more people than you think. And part of that is because no one's ever really encouraged them. And so the book is in part a matter of encouragement. It's like. Lay yourself, lay a disciplinary structure on yourself. Get the chaos in, in, in check. And then you can move towards a state that's freer because it's discipline first. Like, look, if you're going to become a concert pianist, there's going to be several thousand hours of extraordinarily disciplined practice. That's the imposition of order on your potential, let's say. But what comes out of that is a much grander freedom. And so in virtually every freedom that you have in life that's true freedom is purchased at the price of discipline. Your best bet is truth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's always going to do the trick. Right? I mean, sometimes you go fight a dragon and it eats you. And if, the, if you being eaten wasn't a real possibility, it wouldn't be a real fight. And so you see people, like I've seen people in my clinical practice sometimes. I had one client in particular who was undergoing a particularly vicious divorce with someone who was really seriously inclined to take him out and would do pretty much everything at her disposal to do so. And I strategized with him for about three years. And we did everything, like, and hyper carefully. He was a very conscientious and diligent person. And he put into practice everything that we discussed and strategized. And he still pretty much, he got backed into a corner so hard that I didn't know how to help him anymore. So I would say, however, that he, like, he was a very truthful person throughout that. And one thing he did do was part of it was a custody battle. And he did manage, despite his decline in consequence of being repeatedly cornered, I would say, he did manage to establish what I think was a lasting relationship with his kids. So he might have got enough out of what he did to justify it, even though the whole landscape was pretty awful. I think that 
not lying is your best bet. But life is hard and people get run over. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to emerge in any obvious sense triumphant. But if you take the alternative path, path especially when you're facing severe tribulations, let's say, and you complicate those with deceit, you can be sure that whatever tragedy that you're confronting is going to turn into not only tragedy, but something very much akin to hell. And so you might be able to at least minimize the degree of suffering, even if you can't overcome it or transcend it. And that's something, you know. If you really want to solve a complicated problem, maybe you try to solve it a hundred ways, and then you take the best solution. Got it. And look, this happens to entrepreneurs all the time too, you know. Like most entrepreneurs, this is something to know, well, most entrepreneurs, most creative people fail at producing their creative product and monetizing it, right? So your default position, if you're a creative person, is you're gonna fail. And so, and that's because it's hard to come up with something new and it's, and it's hard to present it to the market at the right time and it's hard to market it. Like those things are really, really difficult. And so what successful entrepreneurs do is they just keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And eventually, if they're fortunate, one of their ideas happens to hit the right place at the right time. And so that's also Dar Darwinian in mm -hmm. some sense. You know, you're creating all these little enterprises that are sort of alive. They're, they're run by people after all. And, even if your idea is good, that doesn't mean it will be successful. There's so many things that have to be taken into account. So this is partly why persistence and that's part of conscientiousness is so useful. It's like, you know, what do they say? If, if at first you fail, then try, try again. And, um, and that would probably mean try something different rather than the same thing. But persistence is helpful because it enables you to run many, many experiments. And, and you need to know that the baseline is failure. You know, it's important because otherwise you'll blame that on yourself. I would say for the last 45 years, we've told psychologists have been, have been certainly to blame for this, at least in part. You're okay the way you are. That's what we tell young people. Oh, you're okay the way you are. It's like, and there's nothing worse than you can tell, that you can tell someone who's young than that, especially if they're miserable, you know, and lots of them, well, if they're miserable and aimless, it's like, Oh, I'm miserable and aimless, and sometimes I'm suicidal and I'm nihilistic and I don't have any direction in your life. It's in my life. It's like, well, you're okay the way you are here. <laughs> and it's like, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, look, you know, you're, and you know this, you're useless. You know nothing. You haven't got started. You've got 60 years to put yourself together, and God only knows what you could become. And that's so. That message is so much more, it's so funny because it's so, it's such an attack, but it's so positive because there's faith there in the, in the potential that makes up the person rather than the miserable actuality that happens to be manifesting itself at the moment. And young people respond extraordinarily well to that because, and you know that if you're a parent and you love your, your child, your son, your daughter, what you're trying to foster is the best in them. You want that to manifest itself across the course of their life. You want them to become continually more than they are, to see what they could be. And, well, and I think that's part of the great message of the West, is that that's, that's, the, that's the ethical requirement of individual being in, in, in the proper sense, is to constantly Note that you're not what you could be, to take responsibility for that and to, and to commit yourself, like body and soul, to the attainment of that ideal. You can look at that pessimism that, 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 that constitutes, let's say, the core of what, well, I think it's the core religious message, really, is the, is the tragic nature of the world, the reality of suffering, it's, it's part of the core religious message. But what emerges out of that, properly conceptualized, is a remarkable appreciation for what human beings are capable of. Like we are unbelievably resilient and, and able creatures. And we do not have any conception of our upper limits.
you'll discover a little bit more about your potential as you discover who you are, especially the darker parts of yourself, because then you discover your potential for mayhem. There's some real utility in that, you know, the discovery that you're dangerous. It's such a useful discovery. It's actually something that strengthens you because the first thing that a realization like that can in fact produce is the ambition to incorporate that danger into a higher order personality, that dangerousness into a higher order personality. And that can make you implacable. That can make you someone who can say no when you need to say no. You know, that can make you someone who won't avoid necessary conflict. And so that's that's unbelievably useful. When you're moving through life and you have a, a plan or a dream and it shatters, you know, someone dies or a relationship breaks apart or you, you have a terrible upset in your career or you become ill in some unexpected way, then everything around you falls apart and you plunge into a, well, you plunge into a chaotic underworld. The belly of the whale. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes, exactly that. And then maybe you stay there because it isn't necessarily the case that people get out, you know, people die, people are in despair permanently, but frequently something tragic and terrible befalls you and you fall apart and you learn something profound as a consequence and you put yourself back together and when you come back out you're more than you were when you went in and that's happening in, at a small scale every time you learn something you know you if you ever really learn something it's usually painful it usually means that you have to recognize that you're wrong in some important way you have to let that part of you that's wrong die and then you have to let yes. a new part of you okay so the self imagine that you undergo a series of transformations in your life there are, there are collapses into the chaotic underworld and then re many resurrections. That happens continually. And that's what molds your character. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what are you going to do to take action on it this week? When you write down what day, what time, and what place you're going to take action on something, you have a 91% chance of following through versus just 35% if you got motivated but never wrote down a plan. And when you share your plan and have public accountability, it raises your chances of following through even higher. So that's what I want to do today for you guys. You watch this video. What was your single biggest takeaway and what is your plan to take action on it this week? Let me know. Put it down in the comments below. There's another rule in my book, which is rule nine. Assume that the person that you're listening to knows something you don't. Well, they do. The person you're listening to knows some things you don't. You can be sure of that. Now, whether or not you can get to them is a different matter, but mm. if you do get to them, it's a real deal for you. Mm. That's why you wanna to listen to the other person's arguments is because you're not everything you could be. You don't know the pathway forward with as much clarity as you could. And it's possible, this is one of the wonderful things that I've had the privilege of experiencing as a clinician. You know, because people, it's like I live inside a Dostoevsky novel as a clinician. People come in and they tell me about their lives and I listen to them and they tell me things that are just absolutely beyond belief, you know? And I learn from my clients constantly. Mm. They're, they're telling me honestly about their experience. They tell me things they wouldn't tell anyone else because I actually listen to them. But part of the reason I listen is because I'm desperate to listen. It's like, there's a possibility. I'm gonna do something stupid in the next five yeah. years that's gonna be like fatal. And there's some small possibility that if we have a decent discussion, that you'll tell me something that will eliminate some of my blindness so that I don't have to fall into that particular pit. And if you have a good sensitivity for the depth of the pit, then you know, you're pretty bloody motivated to avoid it. And so, and that, and, and that, and that dialogue is, it's, it's dialogic, it's dialogos, right? It's shared logos. It's the way that we redeem ourselves mutually moving forward. If you wanna change your life for free in the next 30 days, check the link right here below me. Or if you want Jordan Peterson's six pieces of life-changing advice, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy them. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.